In the first episode of our Kubernetes security series, we mentioned that Kubernetes is a very complex system. Its architecture involves many layers, and those layers need to be secure. The first layer, of course, is the environment itself, that is the servers and the network. So those need to be protected through perimeter firewalls, regardless of if you are hosting it in the cloud environment or in your data center. If you are hosting it in the cloud environment, the cloud provider will, will secure that environment for you. However, if you're hosting it in your own environment, you, know, you, might, you, know, you want to make sure that access is restricted to the Kubernetes cluster. And then Kubernetes admin will set up, create a Kubernetes cluster. The cluster is, consists of a Kubernetes master, which hosts the control plane, and also one or more worker nodes. In the previous episode, we talked about how Kubernetes uh, admins can use RBAC or role-based access control to secure the control plane itself. Because if the control plane is compromised, then the whole system is compromised. We also talked about users and how the users are created and managed in Kubernetes. We also talked about, again, how admins can use RBAC to give developers enough access <coughs> so they can install applications to the Kubernetes environment. And those applications will be hosted inside pods. Now, note that by, by default, pods run in the context of uh, the root, which means that if a hacker breaks out of the pod, he or she will have access to the kernel, to the processes and the file system of the host environment, which is very dangerous. Furthermore, if the pod is misconfigured and has inappropriate access to the API server, then the hacker can easily uh, get hold of a control plane and do a lot of damage. And similarly, he or she can spread, uh, access other pods and do a lot more damage. So in this episode, we learn how to protect the pod and its execution uh, execution environment. Here's the agenda for this episode. We will start off by introducing security context object, which defines privileged access control settings for a pod or container. If you recall, we mentioned that pods run in the context of the root, security context of the root, which is not good. So through security context, we can change that. We'll then introduce you to the pod security admission controller, uh, which are, these are a set of security policies that you can apply to your uh, Kubernetes environment to secure, to make your pod more secure. Um, those are really good first step, but there are some situations that those may not satisfy all your security needs, and then we will introduce you to open security agent. So this is an extra layer of security that you can install inside your Kubernetes environment. And, and then it goes way beyond what the pod security admission controller provides for you. It is a very general purpose uh, security provider, and it is not just limited to pods. It can also secure your uh, nodes as well. And finally, we'll talk about leveraging secure envir runtime environment. Um, so this is, that provides a layer between the pod and the host. So and that layer sits down here between the pod and the host, and all the calls are directed through that. So that makes the uh, breaking out of the pod into the uh, host environment very unlikely. So a security context defines privilege and access control settings for a pod or a container. So let's take a look at the YAML and see where we actually can specify the security context. So we have, you're looking at the kind of pods, if you're creating a pod, and under specs, we can have security context. So I 
use a different color uh, to, to see it better. So this is where we set the security context at the pod level. So over here we say, we want to run the process that this pod will be running, so entire pod, the, the pod could have multiple containers. So this setting says, run all of them as user 1000, and the group that the, pro the process will belong to will be 3000. We're also going to set the FS group to um, 2000. You can also set the security uh, context level at the container level. And this is applies to individual containers. And as you can see now, we have those settings again, run as um, user and run as group. However, this has a different, these have different values. So the rule is the, contain, the, the security context set at the container level will override the setting that was set at the, uh, the pod level. So the security context settings include, and this is a table that shows you all the settings can, that can be set for the uh, security context. So let's go through some of them. The first one is allow privilege escalation. So allow privilege escalation controls whether a process can gain more privileges than its parents process. So, and then we have capabilities and we'll go over capabilities in the next uh, screen. Basically, what capabilities can be added or removed from a container. So the container inherits certain capabilities, but we can override that. And the next one is privilege. So run container in the privilege mode. Processes in privileged, in privileged containers are essentially equivalent to root on the host. So defaults to false. So again, this is a dangerous setting. We should always set to false unless it's absolutely necessary and you know what you're doing. So really, Best practices are always set it to false. Read only root file system. It uh, signifies whether the container has a read only root file system. Default is false. So if you are in a run in an environment which you don't want to allow any um, the the pod creates new file or folder, then you set it to false. For instance, you're running in an untrusted environment, then we should turn this to true. Run as user as we show. So this basically says what uh, process the what user the process that it's running and that pod um, is um, we can set that to specific user. Again, the best practices is change that from zero. If we don't specify in the user, it will run as uh, user as uh, as a root, which is not the good practice. And then we saw also run as group, the same thing. We specify what the, the, that person or, or the, the process is running on, what uh, group it belongs to. And run as non-root. So this indicates that the container must run as non-root. So again, the best practice is uh, yes, it to true. And then also there are other options, more um, advanced, such as SE Linux options. Uh, SE Linux defines access control for application process and files on a file system. Basically, you can set these policies ahead of time that if you want to make even more uh, restriction on the pod uh, using uh, SE Linux's uh, rules, then you can do that also. There's also Procmon and SE Comp. Or oh, SE Comp is a Linux kernel feature that can be used to limit processes running in the container to only call a subset of available system calls. So as you can see, we have a lot of options that we can use in order to ensure that the pods are running um, safely. So again, depending on your environment, if you're running in the cloud environment and the, you know in multi-tenant environment, then you probably should take a look, serious look at some of this setting. Um, if you're running in the, um, running some pods that are maybe come uh, third party, and you don't quite trust them, then you should really again take a serious look at some of these settings. So with Linux capabilities, we can grant certain privileges to a process without granting them all the privileges of the root user. To add or remove Linux capabilities for a container, include the capabilities field in the security context section of the container manifest. 
So and we'll see that in the demo, we'll take a look at some of the capabilities that we can add or remove as, as, as an example. But to see the complete list of Linux capabilities from the command line, we can issue man capabilities, and then we'll see it shows us the, all the available capabilities that can be set or removed. So again, you can add or remove privileges again uh, according to your needs. And so this is a partial list. If you go to the command line and run that either from the host to see what options are available, capabilities are available to the host, or you can run it from the container to see what capabilities it inherited or the ones that you set. So that this is the command to uh, we can use to see that. So in our first demo, we are going to take a look at the security context and see some of the settings that we can set. So first, let's go ahead and create a pod. So I'm going to do that on the fly. It's called here doc. So rather than creating a YAML file separately, I'm just going to do that on the fly. It's easier to do that. So let's say cat, then less than, less than, and EOF. So that signifies where the EOF is. So anything in between is the command that needs to be executed. And then within that, we have kubectl apply minus f. And then these are the, uh, the YAML instructions that we're going to run. And for this, I'm just going to create a pod without setting anything. So this is a regular pod that you create. There's nothing really uh, spe spectacular about it. The only thing is that because you're not specifying any specific user, it's going to run um, create this pod and run it uh, in the process. The process that runs this pod will be running as root. So let's go ahead and create that pod. And we see that it was created. So let's double check that on line 21, kubectl get pods and then the test pod. So let's go ahead and get, do that. We see that that's ready. Now let's uh, on line 23, let's go ahead and actually exec into inside the pod. And then take a look at 24, take a look at the processes. So, so PS, let's see that everything is running as root, uh, which is not really good. And then on line 25, ID, so we specifically say what ID uh, the, the current process is running under. So we execute that. We see that this is ID is root. And then the groups is one. So these are other information, but the, the thing is, this is running as the user ID is running as root, and also the 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 group is running as root. So again, this could be very dangerous. If, um, if we definitely need to don't use root if we have we can. So on line twenty six, let's to see what groups the the process the the ID that is running the process is running. It belongs to line 26, so ID minus G. So we we'll see that the groups that um, it belongs to. And now let's go ahead and create a file on 27, hello world, or echo, hello, into, into this file. Let's go ahead and create that file. And then on line 28, let's take a look at the LS minus L. So let's go at the um, the security information and we'll see that it is running as created as root and root. So again, uh, it um, proves that now this this pod is running as 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 a root. And there are many implications for this. If this uh, the hacker breaks out of this um, pod and then into the uh, Kubernetes environment the process is running as root and it can do a lot of damage. So this practice is always set the, the user to a non-root user. So let's go ahead and exit this and let's go ahead and delete this and get ready for the next demo. So in the next demo, we're going to set the run as a user, run as group, and also set the episode or the file system group. So let's go ahead and clear this. Uh, scroll down, and then let's take a look at the YAML that we are going to create. So again, um, the kind is pod, and then we again specify a name and the respect. We create a volume, 
we're testing, and this is the the setting that we are interested in. So the security context, we said that you um, run as user 1000, so it won't be user zero or root anymore. Run as group uh, 3000 and the FS group when the file is created, but under what group? So that would be 2000. And we'll add another, for the pod, we'll add another security settings, uh, security context, which will say, allow privilege escalation to fall. So again, it's a best practice to so do not uh, allow the containers to have more privileges than the, the parent, which is the pod, the, the pod itself. So let's go ahead and run that. And we see that the pod was created. We can again verify that. We see that the pod is ready. So again, let's exec into the pod and then look at the processes. And now you'll see that the process is running as user, uh, all of them is running as user 1000. So this is not root anymore. On line 62, we can also do an ID and we'll see that the, the ID is 1000 and the group is 3000 and the files. Um, when the group, when the uh, fall, file folder is created, it will be belonging to group 2000. So this is good. And then we can uh, again on line, or line 63, ID minus G. So we see what groups the user belongs to. We'll see that only on 3000 and 2000. So those are the groups that it belongs to. And this, these are the groups that we set up here. Let's go ahead and again create. Uh, a, a file and we are putting it in inside uh, the mounted um, volume here. So echo uh, again hello into that. So let's go ahead and run that. You can see that the file was created. And then we do the security check again. Uh, ls minus l. Let's go ahead and run that. And now we will see that it was created under user two thousand, and the fs group is two thousand verb. We set it up here. Okay, let's go ahead and exit and clear that and get ready for the next demo. So in the next demo, we are going to set the security context for any individual container. Um, and we saw actually an example of it above. So but here, Let's take a look at the YAML file. So the security, again, we, at the pod level, uh, run um, as user 1000, again, run as group 3000 and FS group 2000. However, we'll have another security context. And then we're going to override the setting that we um, set up here for this particular container. So if there are multiple containers within that, we can override the setting um, for instance, in this case, user add, run as if we need to. And so under this, now we'll change the user from uh, 1,000 to 4,000, run as, and the group from 3,000 to 5,000. And we see what happens. So let's go ahead and run that, execute that. So again, we have our pod created. Again, to make sure everything is okay, let's go ahead and run that. We'll see that the pod is ready now. We do the same thing again. We exec into the pod. And then we do another check to look at what processes it's running under. So we'll see that the process is running as user 4000. We see that um, here, although we set the run as 1000 as a pod level. However, for this container, we change the overall that. So now it's running at a user 4000. And let's go ahead and then take a look at ID again. And we'll see that it's running at user 4000 and the group 5000. So this is the group that run as group 5000. So that reflects that. And again, look at um, Line model two, ID minus G, what groups the user belongs to. And you see that 5,000 and 2,000. 
let's go then again create um, a file in that mounted uh, directory on line 103 echo hello into that file let's go ahead and do that and then we check again on line 104 ls l and the file and we'll see that the user is uh, 1000 and the fs group is 2000 uh, so we didn't we did not override fs group so it is still running as a 2000 so let's go ahead and exit and clear this so in this section we're going to set capabilities for uh, containers so take let's take a look at the yaml file here so again uh, the kind is pod and under um, so the first thing that we're going to do actually we don't set any capabilities for this so let's go ahead and create a regular pod without um, setting anything so this is basically a um, vanilla um, pod let's go ahead and create that and then we'll check to see what kind of what privileges it has inherited so let's get to make sure the pod is created and we'll see that it's ready now again let's uh, go ahead inside the pod so ex exit inside and then check the process again and we'll see that it's running as root because we didn't set anything at all and then we cd into the proc folder because we want to see what privileges it has um, inherited and this is the command that we uh, use cat status and then what you're looking for is cap uh, PRM or capabilities permitted so let's go ahead and run that and we'll see that it this is the capabilities that it is running that they inherited um, by, by default so let's go ahead and we'll take a um, note of this and then we'll um, see if when, when we change that what happens so let's go ahead and exit and let's go ahead and delete this file, this part. And then let me go ahead and uh, copy and paste the capabilities that we saw for that um, part over here. And we didn't set anything for it. But now we're going to create again, recreate the part, but under security context, uh, we are again going to set the allow privileges to um, allow privilege escalation to false. And now we're going to actually set capabilities. So we are going to set the capabilities, uh, we're going to add cap capabilities to uh, net admin and sysTime. Sys so we, we're adding capabilities for the user. So let's go ahead and run this. Oops, uh, I forgot to include the EOF as part of it. I'll just go ahead and run that. Okay, we see that the pod is created. Again, we double check that to make sure the pod is ready, which is. So again, we exec inside the pod, and then we check this again. Again, it's running as root, and then we um, go to the proc, folder cd slash proc one so this is the process number one that is running and then we again check to see what capabilities it has on line 166 so we'll see that now it has this capability so let's go ahead and copy that and then we can compare it to the one that we previous and we'll see that this is now changed so compare this to this. We see that now. So this is how you check for to see what capabilities this pod has. So that that is the the way to do it. So let's go ahead now, exit the pod. Let's go ahead and delete the pod and clear and get ready for the next demo. Uh, one thing to note is if you want to make sense of this capabilities as numbers, uh, we can run actually this command. I forgot to mention that. So let's go ahead and copy and paste it. So 
on line 172, cap SH minus D code equal to and the code that you have. So for instance, this for to find out what the code this, sorry, this signifies, then you can um, do this. So cap SH minus D code equal to and the part, you probably don't have this command, so you need to run it from the host itself. So let's go ahead and run that. And we see it shows us the capabilities that the, the, the container is inherited. So things such as cap, uh, change ownership, um, override, cap, and so on. So this is a really good command if you want to make sense of these numbers here that you get when you run the capabilities command from the uh, inside the pot. Let's go ahead and clear that. And now we're going to set something very dangerous. And this is actually, I want to show you that you should never actually do this. So um, on the settings that we're going to, so I, I added some documentation here. So the first one is host network set it to true. What this means is um, I explained here, sharing the host network namespace permits processes in the pod to communicate with the process bound to the host uh, loop, uh, loopback adapter. So this is a no-no, and the other one is host IP, the host PID is equal to true. And this one, it says sharing the host PID namespace allows visibility of, of the processes on the host, potentially leaking information such as environment variables and configuration. And then the last one is host IPs, um, IPC, setting to true, it means that sharing the host IPC namespace allows container processes to communicate with the process on the host. So uh, again, if you are not careful and then the developer set these for whatever reason, um, and then we will see that uh, this becomes a very dangerous situation. And if a hacker gets hauled up this pod with these settings, it can do a lot of damage. So let's go ahead and run this. And then we'll talk about how to mitigate that through the uh, setting, through the policies, pod, pod, uh, the new pod security policies that we're, go we're going to talk about next. So let's go ahead and run this. And then make sure the pod is created. So that, scroll down. And then let's exec into this. And then run the PS uh, on line 201. And you'll see now, not only is showing you know, the processes that are running on this pod, but also the host. So this is really, really dangerous situation. And we should never ever do that. So let's go ahead and then uh, again, go to the proc folder and change, take a look at capabilities. And then again, you'll see the capabilities. There. So this is again a no-no. And this is one example of misconfiguration of a pod that could lead to really this disaster situation in, in, your, uh, in your cluster. So let's go ahead and exit and delete the file and then get ready for the next demo. So as we just saw, security context and other settings provide important knobs to make our pods and as a result, our cluster more secure. But the same knobs and settings also, if we set, it in, set them incorrectly, make our pods and as a result, again, our cluster less secure. So we need to come up with some ways of enforcing best practices and do not allow cr the creation of pods that could compromise the security of our environment. And that can be achieved through a couple of ways, at least two ways um, that we will be discussing in this course. One is to use uh, pod security policies or pod security best practices. And that is enforced through an admission controller and it's available uh, from Kubernetes version 1.3 and above. And there's another way that we will be discussing after this, and that is OPA or Open Policy Agent. So let's start with pod security policies, best practices. So the Kubernetes pod security standards define different isolation level for pods. 
This standard lets you define how you want to restrict the behavior of pods in a clear, consistent fashion. The pod security admission controller must be enabled, and it is enabled by default in Kubernetes version 1.3 and above. Pod security restrictions are applied at the namespace level when pods are created. So you have to specify a namespace, um, and then the object or the pods that are in that namespace, then you can apply the, the best practices on. You can also enable that for all spaces, but the, the enforcement is at the uh, namespace. Pod security admission places requirements on a pod security context and other related fields according to the three levels defined by the pod security standards, privilege, baseline, and restricted. So let's take a look at each one of those. So the privilege really means unrestricted policy, which means that really we are not um, enforcing anything uh, for that namespace. Baseline means minimally restrictive policy, which prevents non-privileged escalations, allows a default minimally specified pod configuration. And restricted, that is for heavily restricted policy, following the current uh, pod hardening best practices. Kubernetes defined a set of labels that you can set to define which of the predefined pod security standard levels. Again, they were privileged, baseline, or restricted to use for a namespace. The label you select defines what action the control plane takes if a potential violation is detected. So these are various uh, modes. Uh, enforce means policy violations will cause the pod to be rejected. So if you try to create a pod and that pod violates the, um, the best practices, then that you cannot save that. So that's enforce. Audit means policy violations will trigger the addition of an audit annotation to the event recorded in the audit log, but are otherwise allowed. And warning, the policy violations will trigger a user-facing warning, but are otherwise allowed. So let's take a look at one example. I will go through that in the demo as well. So this, we are defining a namespace. And um, let's go through this. This manifest defines a namespace. This is the name of the, name, uh, the namespace that blocks any pods that are uh, don't satisfy the, the baseline policy requirements. So if you look at this, this is a API version, and the kind is namespace. And under metadata, we select a name, and these are the labels. So for the pod-security.kubernetes.io slash enforce baseline. So this is the baseline that we are selecting. So if uh, this file, the baseline policies are uh, violated, then pods will, will be rejected. And generates a user-facing warning um, and adds an audit annotation to any created pod that does not meet the restricted policy requirements. So if we look down here, we are setting now this to our desired enforced level. pod-security.kubernetes.io slash audit restricted. So if it violates the restricted mode, then it audits, uh, creates an audit log. However, it will allow the pod to be created. And we also set the version uh, up here and also here, what version we are adhering to. And at the time of uh, recording, the version was 1.24. We also set another one, which is the warning, pod-security.kubernetes.io slash warning to restrict it. Uh, so uh, again, it doesn't prevent the user if the FOD is violating the restricted uh, level. However, the user will see an error message or a warning message as he or she tries to create a pod. And then again, we are setting the, the pod, the uh, version to 1.24. Uh, 1 
So let's take a look at what is actually enforced under the baseline security standards policies. So according to the <coughs> documentation, the baseline policy is aimed as ease of adoption for common containerized workloads while preventing known privilege escalation. This policy is targeted at application operators and developers of non-critical applications. So basically this is, I would say, an entry point into enforcing and introducing security best practices. And once your developers get used to this standard, then they can move on to uh, more restrictive, that is a restricted uh, uh, security standards uh, policies. So these are the things that are enforced. Host namespaces, sharing the host namespaces must be disallowed. As we saw, if we enable host network um, or host, I, uh, host PID or host IPC, we, we are really opening up the gate to the hackers. So this is really, uh, these are dangerous settings that it should not be allowed, should not be enabled. Previous containers, the previous um, pod disabled most security mechanism and must be disallowed. And the capabilities, as we saw, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of Linux capabilities can be enabled or disabled. But according to this policy, adding additional capabilities beyond those listed below must be disallowed. So these are the allowed additional capabilities that you can add to your to the pod. Host pod volumes. Host pod volume must be forbidden because that is you'll be sure you'll be mounting um, the volume inside your file system on the node, and which is, opens the security hole into your node. Uh, it is best to use other types of storage, such as NFS, or if you're on the cloud, um, hosting on the cloud, then uh, usually the, host, the, those, the cloud environment, they provide their own storage classes that you can safely use. Host ports, host ports should be disallowed or at minimum restricted to a known list. So this is the way of um, allowing traffic from the pod to the outside world, um, sharing um, a port on the on a node. Um, so this is again bad bad, bad practice. Uh, either use better methods such as node port um, cluster IP or that if you're on the cloud and you have a load balancer and then use the load balancer option, which is the best, actually best option that you can select. App armor on supported hosts, the runtime slash default app armor profile is uh, applied by default. So really um, don't do anything. The baseline policy should prevent overriding or disabling the default app armor profile. So app armor is uh, another way of, for Linux to apply security policies. So again, um, you don't have to do anything, just don't disable that and don't try to change that. SE Linux, setting the SE Linux type is restricted. So by default is actually restricted. Again, you don't have to do anything. Don't, don't just muck around, just leave it as is. Slash proc mon type, under this policy, the default proc masks are set up to reduce uh, attack surface and should be um, required. So, I should, and then um, SecCom, SecCom profile must not be explicit uh, set to undefined. Again, just leave it uh, as the default. And SysCTL, SysCTLs can disallow security mechanism or affect all containers on a host and should be disallowed except for an allowed safe subset. So again, if you, you don't know what it is, you, know, you just leave it alone because then again, again, you may introducing uh, security vulnerability in your application. Now let's take a look at the restricted pod security policies. The restricted policy is aimed at enforcing current pod hardening best practices at the expense of some compatibility. It is targeted at operators and developers of security critical applications, as well as lower trust users. 
the following list of controls should be enabled. Uh, so basically, these are what is enforced under the restricted mode. So everything from the baseline profile. So uh, you cannot, uh, if any of those rules are under the baseline profile are violated, then you cannot proceed actually. So all of those should be uh, followed and respected. The, and their volume types, the restricted policy only permits the following volume types, config Mac, CSI, downward um, API, empty directory, ephemeral, persistent volume claim, projected and secret. And then the next one, privilege, escalation, and that is under Kubernetes version 1.8 and above. A lot privilege escalation must not set to true. And then running as non-root, containers must be required to run as non-root users. And next one, running as non-root user, and that is on version 1.3 and above, containers must not set run as user to zero. Again, the effect is the same as running as a root user. Uh, second, and that is version 1.19 and above, the second profile must be explicitly set to one of the allowed values. Both the undefined profile and the absence of the profile is, uh, are pro prohibited. Allowed users are runtime default and local host. And the last one, capabilities and their 1.22 and above, containers must drop all capabilities and are permitted to add, uh, add back only the uh, net bind service capabilities. So in this demo, we will showcase the new pod security standard. So let's go ahead and first of all, we're going to create a new nameswitch and this is basically the same YAML that I showed you during the uh, presentation. We are going to create a new namespace, so API version v1. The kind is namespace. And under metadata, we specify first the name. So the name is uh, test-baseline.ns or namespace. And then we specify the labels. And this is how we enforce the security best practices, uh, pod-security.kubernetes.io slash enforce dash uh, a colon baseline. So basically we are going to enforce baseline new security best practices. And then we also need to set uh, the, the enforcement um, API version, which is v um, 124 At the time of recording this, this video, this was the latest version of Kubernetes. We are also going to um, do some auditing and issuing warning if the pod does not adhere to the restricted uh, security best practice, pod security best practices. So on line 16, pod-security.kubernetes.io slash audit colon restricted. So it just basically just creates an audit log. And then we also need to set the API version, again, v124. We, uh, we are also going to warn the user that this pod is not up to the standard. Um, um, it, it violates the restricted policies, and again, we set the version 124. So again, if any of the baseline um, policies are broken, then this pod will fail. We cannot even, the user cannot create a, uh, the pod. Um, however, if that, that passes, um, baseline um, policies are not broken or not violated, but it violates or restricted, then we create uh, an audit log and we also warn the user. So let's go back to the script here and going to actually apply that YAML to uh, kubectl apply minus f and the name of the YAML file. Let's go ahead and run that. Let me see that it was created. Now we are going to create a pod and this pod violates some of the rules. And uh, let's go through that. Um, I'm going to create this pod on the fly. Um, it's called here doc. Again, this is the command and I'm going to created in the uh, namespace we just created, which was test-baseline-ns. And then this is the actual um, YAML that will be executed. So API version v1, kind is pod, 
and the metadata, I call it dangerous part. And it is dangerous because if you look at um, under spec, we'll see that it sets the uh, host ne um, network, um, host um, PID, and host IPC, they're all true. And I, again, specified why they're dangerous. I already talked about them, but as just a reminder, I documented why these are dangerous. Um, and everything else is really the same. We specify where the image is coming from. So let's go ahead and run this um, YAML to, to create a new pod. Let's see what happens here. We see that it says error from the server forbidden. Error while creating this pod is forbidden. Why? Because it violates pod security, baseline uh, v124, host namespaces. And these are the three settings that cause the creation of this pod to fail. So we'll see that now we have one, at least one namespace that is enforcing the baseline security best practices. So let's move on. And let's go ahead and create, try to create another pod. And this is exactly the same image um, as this one here. The only difference is I'm not setting anything at all. So previously I set some dangerous stuff. Here, I'm not setting anything. Let's go ahead and run that. So let's take a look at command first. kubectl, create deployment, hello world, minus n. So we're putting it again in the test dash baseline.ns and where the image is coming from. That's all. So let's go ahead and run this, what happens. First, look at, at the bottom. It says that the deployment um, was created. So there was no problem there. However, we'll see that there's a bunch of warnings here. And the reason for this is because this pod uh, is not um, adhering to some of the um, restricted policies, uh, such as, for instance, allow escalation uh, has to be false. And because we haven't said anything, it's actually, it means it's true. So and there's a bunch of other ones that this pod is breaking. So again, this is a really good practice that you gradually introduce your developers to following the security best practices without preventing them from doing their job. And, and over time, then you can graduate uh, from the baseline and go to the restricted. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear that. Now, as we saw, um, I enabled uh, the baseline security best practices for a brand new um, namespace. What about the existing one? And this is where um, this actually provides some really nice feature. On line 34, or let's say we, we want to do an evaluation and see um, how conformant um, our, all namespaces are. Um, do they follow the uh, you know, security best practices or not in the existing pods or, or not? So we can run that and do, uh, they call it dry run, basically, um, we are not actually going to enable baseline, enforce baseline policy for all existing names. I just want to see the status or the state where we are in. So kubectl label dash dash dry run um, equal to server dash dash override ns dash dash all and then pod dash security dot Kubernetes dot io dot enforce um, equal to baseline. So again, we want to see, and what it says basically is this, uh, evaluate, look at all the current namespaces and see if uh, the pods um, adhere to the baseline security best practices. So let's go ahead and run that. As you can see now, it, find, uh, it found at least three um, places where uh, these pods are not adhering to the best practices. So you can get the feel for um, how much work may be involved if you want to enable the, let's say, baseline for all your namespaces. Let's go ahead and clear that. And line 38, um, if you've done your homework and you, know, um, you um, are not confident that your users or your developers understand how to con uh, conform to the security best practices, at least for baseline, then you can turn it on for all namespaces, and that is the command. Um, if you want to do it just for a single namespace, and you can do that as well. So this is the command, kubectl label dash dash override ns, and I, maybe I have a namespace called 
my existing namespace and, and the, the level that enforcement that I'm going to do and this one restricted. So uh, as you can see, it gives you a really a good runway to prepare your developer, uh, the, uh, developers to gradually start adhering to the pod security best practices. Now, the last thing I want to show you is for restricted policies. So let's go take a look at the YAML. Again, I'm going to run this um, YAML on the fly. Um, so again, API version of V1, the kind is namespace. And I call this the um, test dash restricted NS or namespace. Um, and the labels, same as before, the only difference is I set the enforcement to restrict it. So everything is really the same. And I'm going to also uh, create other lock for the violators of this policy. Let's go ahead and run this. And we see that that was created. Let's go ahead and clear that. And now uh, here I'll show you, um, I'm showing you uh, a pod which adheres to the security best practices for restricted. So let's go through some of the settings here. Under security context, we need to set the sec, uh, comp profile. We need to uh, explicitly set it to a type and the, one of the accepted type is uh, runtime default. We also need to set a run as um, non-root to, to true. We also need to specify uh, a, uh, a user that this process will be running as a non-root, so this will be a 1,000, it's not zero. So it will be a non-root that this uh, container will be running under. And then under uh, for, uh, containers, we need to also set a few things. First of all, allow privilege escalation is equal. We have to explicitly set this to false. And I think we saw that in the previous demo. And then under capabilities, we need to, first of all, drop all capabilities. And the only thing that is allowed is a net underscore bind underscore service. So again, this is another thing that you need to consider is um, how much changes will require and how much time will require for your team to adhere to the more restrictive, which is the restricted uh, best practices, how they adhere to. So if I, I'm going, uh, if I run this right now, this will um, pass. Well, let's say I'm going to, uh, do some change here and let's say I'm going to comment this out. So I commented out uh, this line here. So let's go ahead and execute this and see if it succeeds or not. And we'll see that we get an error from server and then violates pod security again and that. And then this is what it's saying. Root, uh, run as uh, non-root is not true, which because I commented out. So if I remove this, and if I run this now, this time it succeeds. So this is an example of, um, you know, how to uh, adhere to the security best practices for restricted, uh, in the restricted mode. So I just saw the new pod security standards are a great way for enforcing security best practices on pods. But there are other situations where you want to also establish best practices, such as, for instance, all new namespaces must have a label, or all container images must come from an approved repo, or all pods must have an upper bound for resource usage, or prevent conflicting ingress objects from being created. So these are just a few examples of other things, um, other ways that you want to establish best practices and enforce policy. And for that, we need a, a different platform. And that platform is Open Policy Agent or OPA. The Open Policy Agent is an open source general purpose policy engine that unifies policy enforcement across the stack. OPA provides a high-level dec declarative language called uh, Rego that lets you specify policy as code and simple APIs to offload policy decision-making from your software. You can use OP OPA to enforce policies in microservices, Kubernetes, CI/CD pipelines, 
API gateways and more. So this is a, uh, a sample, a very small sample of where OPA is supported. So you can see um, things obviously such as Kubernetes, Terraform, Envoy, um, Istio, PHP, Spring, Kafka. So once you learn OPA, then uh, you know the knowledge is very valuable. You can transfer it to other platforms as well. So let's take a look at a quick overview of how OFA works. So OFA has really is in two parts, and this is one feature of OFA is that the decision-making engine is different from the enforcement engine. So the decision, uh, how does, uh, when the request comes into the engine, uh, for instance, from a service, you have a service such as Kubernetes or other environment, that you want to make a decision if this action is allowed or if uh, is the person allowed to perform this operation or not. So the decision that it sends to the OPA engine, and then it's really two parts into uh, OPA. One is the policies that you write and the language that it's used is Rego. And there's also this data that supports, uh, it's used to support the decision. So. When the request comes in, the decision is either yes or no. Is it allowed, for instance, or not allowed? And that decision then is sent to the enforcement engine. And depending on the environment, the enforcement engine will be different. For instance, in Kubernetes, that enforcement is done through OPA Gatekeeper, which is a webhook admission controller. Other systems have their own enforcement mechanism. So let's take a look at the OPA gatekeeper. So you may recall from the previous video that Kubernetes allows decoupling policy decision from the API server by means of admission controller, of epochs. Um, so if you recall, there are really three pillars of um, security in Kubernetes, authentication, authorization, and admission controller. So authentication, uh, ensures that you are allowed to uh, connect to uh, Kubernetes. And then authorization uh, verifies that you are allowed to perform that whatever operation you are going to do. And the third one is in case of creating a new object such as a pod or namespace, then you're not, that object is not violating any policies. So let's see how um, Gatekeeper has been implemented um, as an admission controller in Kubernetes. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to install um, Gatekeeper. And we install that through QCPTL apply. And this is the location that we get it from. Um, we'll go through that again through in the uh, uh, demo. So don't worry about remembering all this. So once we ap apply that, then it um, creates an admission controller and webhook for it. And also include and uh, install the OPA uh, decision engine um, inside it. So let's say we want to create a new policy, OPA policy that states that when we create a new namespace, um, the namespace should have a label ref uh, reflecting the name of the namespace. For instance, if we create a namespace called HR, we also need to create a label that goes with that called HR. But we don't want to create for each new namespace, create a new um, policy from scratch. We want to be able to at least reuse part of this um, policy that we create. And so let's go through the process of how we can accomplish this. The first thing that we need to do is we need to create what is known as a constraint table. Let's go through this. And this constraint table basically includes the policy that we want to implement. So it, we create the policy inside of this. So we'll go through that. So the, 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 the kind is a constraint template. Um, and then, so this is, once you install Gatekeeper, then it will add a new kind called constraint table. And then we select the name for it, like K8, S require labels, and then we have uh, under that spec and CRD. So the CRD is a clue that this will be actually um, saved 
as a CRD inside etcd. And then under specs, uh, we select the name for it again. Um, so this name is almost the same, but by convention, we capitalize the first letter of um, every word. And then um, going down, we have the validation section. And then we need to, uh, we want to pass in parameters. For instance, um, when you create a new um, namespace for HR, then you need to, you know, pass in the label HR for this engine to um, decide or make a decision uh, and va validate it. If you are creating in the future a different call uh, namespace like marketing, then we will pass marketing as part of this. So, and the properties we define labels, and then we define what type of object this is, the type is array, and item is string. So we can multiple, pass in multiple objects, multiple labels if we want to. And then we have the target section. And the, the, the target for this is admission.k.s.gatekeeper.s. Basically, what is the enforcement mechanism for this uh, rules, for this policy? And since we are in Kubernetes, in Kubernetes, this is implemented as the gatekeeper, uh, admission controller, and webhook. And so now, um, we are going to actually now define the policy. And the language that is used is called Rego. So I, I do realize that, you know, uh, this is new. And obviously, honestly, this, uh, you know, the whole Re Rego language, um, you know, OPA and Gatekeeper deserve its own video. But I'm just going through high level. If you don't, you know, you don't have to understand everything. You just hopefully get the... Um, main part of that so you can uh, inquire that and you know do research on your own and learn it. So we have under Rego we have the package the name of the package is the one that we created up here so that would be kind of import that um, into here and then this section is called a rule and this rule is called violation so from here to the end we are defining a rule in this case, violation. So basically, what constitutes as violation, and we define that inside here. And then once this violation, uh, well, if it's, um, somebody violates this rule, then it throws um, a message or exception. And that message is defined at the bottom here. So this is really a little bit unusual language, so bear with me. And then we define a parameter called provider. So the goal is here to ensure that we are passing in the appropriate label for the namespace that we are creating. So we are, we are creating, um, again, a namespace for marketing, then we, need, we, 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 have, we should expect um, a, a label passed in called um, marketing by the user. So how does it get that? How do we, uh, this um, label or this property is actually populated? So that is done. We need to define another object called instant um, constraint. And in that we define, um, let's say we are defining uh, um, that constraint for uh, the rule for marketing. So we specify, uh, we pass in from there, from the constraint, instant constraint, the label HR marketing into this. And also we specify to what object this applies. So here we don't really see anything is it applying to names, uh, namespace or, um, or pod. So that is decided again on a different uh, constraint called instant um, constraint and we'll go through that next. Uh, so think of it as a class definition and then we create an instance of this class, and then we pass in the parameters that require. So think of it this way as an object-oriented language. But anyway, so we define what is um, provided. So this will hold what is um, sent uh, or what the user has created or is about to create is passed into this. So let's go through that. 
This is called um, a comprehension. So we define a variable called label, and then that label becomes the indexer or uh, the looper that goes through that. And input, the statement is input.review.object. So what does that mean? Input is what is passed to this constraint table. Dot .review means what is actually the admission controller review is passing it to, to, this, object, to uh, this object automatically. So for instance, if you are creating a namespace, this is the, uh, the payload or the JSON uh, um, representation of the, uh, the namespace. So if the user is trying to create um, a namespace called um, a namespace, then that object uh, the, is, is, um, request is again um, intercepted by the admission controller and admission controller sends it this JSON to this. So that's why we know what you're looking for. So if you want to know, uh, once you start, you know, creating your own rules um, you know, um, and uh, custom um, templates or rules uh, in OPA, the best thing to know, if you want to know what the object rep representation is, you just do a kubectl get, for instance, namespace, uh, the name of the space, and then minus o JSON. So that will create a JSON of a namespace so you know what you're looking for. So inside that, input.review.object. So review and object are extra tags that are um, added by the admission controller. But within that, then we'll have metadata, which is this metadata, and then dot labels that. So that is a representation. So basically what, what it does, it goes and peeks inside, we're peeking inside uh, the um, representation of the namespace, and we are going to grab all the labels here, and that's, that's what it does. <clears throat> and then it goes through that automatically. We don't have to write any code. It goes through that automatically as many as labels that has been passed. In this case, only one label has been passed. It could be many. So it goes through that and finds all of them and then puts in this provider. So the provided will have all the labels that are passed by this object into um, um, the engine. And the next one is, so this is what is being created by the user. We also need another, uh, we also look inside the parameter that we define up here. And we'll see what um, needs to be validating again. So it is HR or is it marketing? So we'll get that input that parameter. So again, required is equal to, again, we use a value, a label, a value called label. And in this case, label is equal to specifically. And then input dot parameters dot labels and then underscore in bracket. So basically, uh, what it means is loop through. So the underscore is a silent, it's called a silent parameter, a variable. So it goes through that, like the above, goes through that, and then all the labels that we need to um, pass. In this case, it's probably one, maybe it's just HR. And then we uh, get that, put that in another array. So we have now two array. One is provided what's um, the user is providing as part of this and what is required the user to pass in. And then we do um, another, create another variable called missing. And that would be the difference between required and um, um, provided. So let's say required is one. And they, they say we are looking for HR and provided maybe uh, also HR in this case required minus HR, so the will be a zero um, array with zero variables. So if you, when we do the count of missing, if it's a zero, if it's greater than zero, which means that required um, is, let's say it's required one and provided is zero. So one minus zero is one. In this case, we are violate, this is violating the rule because 
um, it has not passed the required nations. Uh, and so if that's the case, then this uh, exception is thrown that you must provide a label. So this is really a quick summary of um, how this is working. Again, I, I do realize a little bit um, more information that you might be you know, processing right now, but hopefully it gives you um, some motivation to go and start you know, doing it on your own. It's not difficult. It's just a little bit of the language itself, a little bit unusual. Maybe it looks a bit unusual. But once you get to, uh, the idea that you get the JSON object is passed inside that, then you can work with that and create your own rule. Anyway, <clears throat> once we create this constraint template, then we template, then we need to apply it. Again, like um, usual, uh, as usual, kubectl apply minus f, and then this would be the name of this, um, the file that contains this um, template. And then that would be created as <coughs> a policy object. So the next thing, so now we have a general rule that we've created for um, namespaces to have temp um, um, labels. Next thing that we need to do is now we need to also now to create what is known as constraint instance. So the kind would be the 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 kind that we just created the constraint and the 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 the, the template that we just created early on in the next uh, previous step. So that would be the kind that this applies. So this is basically think of it as creating a new instance of that template that we just created earlier. And then we specify a name for it, uh, ns-mast-have-hr. And their spec, if you have any if you have any label match, we specify here. And then we specify the kind. What that what does the the constraint template template that we created, what does it apply, what objects actually apply to? And then we specify API groups. So that is all the um, API groups, and within that, we are looking for namespaces. So the kind is namespace. So that's how this namespace um, type is then, is the one that uh, is really, um, that uh, we are using for, uh, the type of constraint that we are going, the object is applies to namespaces. And then what namespaces applies to, in this case, HR. So. In the future, if you want a new one for marketing, then we'll create exact same uh, constraint instance, and then we specify instead of HR, we um, specify marketing, and th that is how we, re we will be able to reuse the constraint uh, constraint table that we created early. And the parameters, and this is how we specify. Okay, this is now labels HR, and this is the parameter that was passed will be passed into the constraint table that we talked about earlier. So once we apply that, again, kubectl apply and then minus f and then the name of this file and then we create again, persist that into a CRD. So now that we have this um, constraint or policy created, let's go ahead and now try to um, create a new name system. Kubectl uh, uh, create ns or namespace hr, but we are not passing any uh, label. So let's see what happens next. So the request goes to API server, the admission controller, webhooks, and then goes to IOPA, and then it evaluates um, the rule and it tells um, decides that this is violating the policy because it's not specifying a label and then is webhook, it issues an error. So this is the exact error that we will be seeing in the demos. So error from server forbidden, admission webhook, validation.gatekeeper.sh, deny the request, and this is the name of the like instant uh, constraint that we created, you must provide labels HR. So this is a quick overview of how we can um, the process of creating um, a policy in um, Opera. So let's do a few examples of creating policies 
um, OPA-based policies in Kubernetes. So I've mentioned the first thing that we need to do is we need to install OPA. And this is how to do that, um, kubectl apply minus F. And then we can get this from this location. Um, I've already done that, so I'm not going to go uh, reinstall that. So, But that's just how you install it. Very easy to do. And then the first example that we are going to do is the one that we just walked through in the um, previous section and basically requiring um, a label. So I went through the process. Um, again, I'm not going to go through that. What I'm going to do is now I'm going to execute this. So again, I'm um, run, running this as here doc. So and I'm going to directly execute that. And then we'll see that it created uh, our constraint policy. We also need to now create an instant policy. So again, it's exact same code that we just went through. Um, in this case, we are creating this <coughs> instant um, template for uh, HR. So it applies to when we create HR, a namespace, we need to specify um, a, a label. So let's go ahead and do that, execute that, and we will see that it also created the constraint. And now let's try that. Now let's say on line 53, kubectl create nshr. I mean, you're not passing any label. So as we saw in the um, Previous section, we'll, we get the exact same error that we went through. We get error from the server. Basically, uh, the request is not is rejected because we are not supplying the required uh, label. So let's take a look at another example. And in, in this example, we want to make sure that all the container images are coming from uh, what we call trusted registry. So. Again, we define um, the kind, which is a constraint template, and we select a name for it. And then under spec names, uh, we again um, select the, um, the same name as kind. And then under validation, we define uh, properties. And in this case, we have one property called image, and the type is uh, string. And then under targets, Again, we are dealing with Kubernetes, so the enforcer would be admission and controller and gatekeeper. And then under Rego, we define the, the actual logic for this. And then we, again, we import the package we define up here, uh, the constraint. And then we define the rule. And again, the, the rule will be violation. And then uh, let's go through the code here for line by line. So 79, input.review.object.kind equal equal to pod. So basically, we are only interested in pod. If the kind is pod, then we proceed. Otherwise, we do not, we will not proceed. And then sum i, we are going to define. Sum i means we are defining a local variable called i. And then we define a variable which basically is an array and uh, which is um, equal to input dot review dot object dot spec dot containers and that and then the index would be i dot image so basically it goes through a loop for each one of the, how, how many numbers uh, number of containers that we have within the pod so recall that a pod can have multiple containers so we, for each one of those we go through a loop and then we construct a, an array which will um, have on the, all the images that are part of that container. And then we define something called required, which is input.parameters.register. So that would be passed by the instant um, template, the, the, the valid or trusted um, registry or repo that you're sending in. And then if it's not, it goes through the loop again, and then for each image, it ensures that the registry is uh, the the the, um, the container, um, the image is coming from the trusted basically it matches the 
the image and the required registry and to make sure that it's coming from the trusted that. So again, we we'll go through that for all the containers within that um, um, pod. And if, um, if it violates the rule, then it um, exits out and then throws an exception. And then we um, define, the, again, we define now this is the constraint template. The kind would be um, the, the template is just defined uh, up here, the, uh, the constraint template. So that would be the name of that. And then we select a name for it, which is images must come from GCR. So in this case, we, are, we say that all the images must come from uh, Google repository. And then under kinds, again, we have API groups and the kinds would be, again, pods. We only going to, it would be only applied to pods, Kubernetes objects. And the namespace that we want, uh, it applies to is marketing prod, dash prod. And the parameters, the registry uh, has to be um, gsgcr.io. So let's go ahead and execute um, each one of those. Let's go ahead and execute the constraint template first. We'll see that that was created. And we do the same thing for the instant template. So let's see that's also created. Now we're going to um, create a pod. So uh, kind is pod version v1. And then we specify the image nginx. So this is coming from um, Docker. It's not coming from um, Google. Let's see what happens when we execute it. Let's go ahead and execute that. And see that it throws an exception as we expected because it's not coming from the right um, registry. Okay, let's do one more, the last one. This um, service type must not be node port. For instance, you maybe come up, uh, coming up with um, a rule that all the uh, production services must, must use either cluster IP or load balancer. Uh, because node port creates problem. Um, if one of the nodes goes down and you are binding to that node, then um, it's, it's not good. So, Maybe you want to create a rule that um, will reject um, the service when you're creating it if it's a node port. So again, it's similar to previous one. We specify, we create a constraint table for it, a template for it, and we name it whatever we want. And again, it was similar to previous one and the regular, this is the, how we define the, the, um, the logic basically. And here we say input.kind um, is service. So basically we are looking for service and input.operation is create. So what kind of operation verb is, um, we are interested in and that is create. And also, so all of these must um, satisfy this. And input.review.object.type is node port. And the last one, then the message would be node port services are not allowed. So if, if it satisfies all these three um, conditions, then we are violating the rule. So let's go ahead and execute this and create that. So we see that that created. Oops. Now we need to create an instant template. Again, we select the, um, the type that we just created, and then we select a name. This is the name of our rule, and then insert rule, and then under kinds, we are only interested in services, and the namespace that this applies to is marketing pod. So let me clear this. Let's go ahead and apply this also. You see that that was also created. So since we are created, we are interested in marketing uh, dash prod. So let's go ahead and actually create this first, this namespace. Let's go ahead and create that. Because that's created. Now let's go ahead and create um, marketing and a deployment for, for that. 
that was created. Next line, we are going to now create a service, line 159. And then, but the image is coming from, or, or the service is node port. So uh, let's go ahead and execute that. So again, kubectl minus n marketing prod. So we are, we are going to create the service in the marketing dash prod namespace. We expose and uh, deployment, hello world. This is a port number um, and the target port number and the type you specify as node port. So let's go ahead and create that. And again, we'll see that this is not allowed. We just violated the rules that we um, just defined. So hopefully it gives you some idea of how uh, to go about creating um, OPA policies in Kubernetes. So in this section, we are going to talk about how the methods that we can use to sandbox the container runtime environment. That is, make the container, um, make it more difficult for container to reach out and directly access resources on the whole, such as memory, uh, you know, processes that are running on the on the server, um, file system, network, etc. So, as we saw um, in the previous sections, a misconfigured container can reach out and actually grab um, those resources. So we need to be careful, especially if you are running pods and containers that uh, may not be. I, you know, 100% trustworthy, maybe from the resources that you don't know where they're coming from. Um, it may be best to run those inside the sandbox. Um, but realize that there is uh, overhead, so uh, you have to be judicial in how and when to use sandbox. So definitely for containers that are coming from a different uh, source, for instance, your partner and you don't know your partner is following the best practices, then you need to put, put some, uh, I would suggest uh, some guardrails around those containers and put them in their own sandboxes. And then in this session, we're going to discuss how we can do that. But before that, let's go ahead and review what happens when we deploy an application, a pod. So we, uh, from the command line, we say kubectl apply minus f, and this is the, um, contains a YAML that has the code to install a pod. So when we apply that, then it goes to API server. API server then calls the kubelet <coughs> on each node. And then the kubelet calls CIR, which is container runtime interface. And the CRIs, uh, the supported ones are container deep, for instance, and CIRO. And then CIR then downloads the image from whatever registry, such as Docker or whatever other um, approved registry that you might have, download the image. And then finally, the pod is created. And then CRI, CIR then calls into CNI, or Container Network Interface plugin, where it actually creates the pod network namespace. Then it set up the network. Um, and also adds the IP address, uh, assigned IP address to that uh, interface, and then sets the default route, and finally adds the route to the uh, container on the host. So this is all you know, well and good, but uh, the issue is if the, the container is not configured correctly, then um, it will be able to reach out again and misconfigure it a container will be able to reach out and you know wreak havoc on your system. So we need a way to, uh, in situations where we don't maybe 100% trust the, the container that is coming to us, or we, we are not sure if they fall in the best practice, then we need to sandbox those environment and make it more difficult and add uh, guardrails in order to prevent them from directly accessing uh, the resources on the host. And this is the, um, what we're going to do in the next section, a few sections, a few slides, we're going to, again, talk about the detail and the issues in more detail and the solution that we have. So I'm mean, going to introduce you to um, secure runtime, and such as GWiser and Kata in this demo, uh, or of course, we're going to talk about GWiser, but Kata provide similar functionality. So as mentioned earlier, the container runtime provider, such as Containerd and CIRO, 
manage the container, to create the container, and when the container gets to the run state, they are run in a process known as run C. Uh, let's take a look at how that works. So let's say we have a worker node and then we deploy a couple of container pods. And as you can see, when they get to the execution state, they will be running inside a process called run C. And again, as mentioned earlier, this doesn't really provide any protection. If a pod is misconfigured, then it may be allowed to uh, get inside the host and start interacting with the process and the file system, which is um, not a good idea, especially in the situation when the pod is not trusted. So secure container runtimes, uh, such as GVisor and Kata, provide a layer of protection and redirection between the containers and the host. So now let's take a look at the GVisor overall architecture. So there are three layers, basically. Application which runs inside the container, then we have the GVisor and the host. And the GVisor has two components inside it. One is Sentry, Sentry, which is a kernel written in Go. So basically, it provides almost all the functionality of the, the kernel that like the host provides. However, none of the, um, very rarely, the calls gets to the host kernel unless there's something that which is not implemented by Sentry yet that is forwarded to uh, the host kernel. But it is becoming uh, more complete and really almost all of the calls nowadays probably will be uh, answered by Sentry. So the application will, will not have any direct access to kernel. The same thing with um, file system. So Gopher provides file system access to, for containers. So again, that becomes a middleman between the container and uh, the host. And again, as, at no, in, at no um, point, um, the, the application will have direct access to the file system. So how do we actually configure pods to use GVisor is actually pretty short, straightforward, and we will see that in the demo as well. We define our pod as kind as pod as usually we do. And metadata, again, we provide a name for the pod and their spec. This is new, so we have to specify the container runtime class as GVisor. Once we install GVisor and we go through the process of how we do that again, in the demo, but to actually consume that is pretty straightforward. And then we define things such as um, containers, uh, name, and where, where to get it from, what direct, uh, repository we get it from. So now let's, let's go through the process of installing GYZ and configure it, and also use a demo application. So the first step we need to do is we need to do some press, uh, prep work. We need to install the appropriate dependencies to allow APT to install packages by HTTP. So let's go and run that. And then it may take longer for you because I've already done that. So be patient when it runs that. Then we need the next step is to configure the, the key used to sign archives and repositories. So this is in two lines. First of all, we need to get the um, GIP, um, GPG key on line 11, so let's go ahead and done that. And I'm going to override again, I already have that on my system. And then we need to actually do the uh, signing and that is the command, that's done. Now the next step is to install a shim called run sc, so that basically for the call, rather going through run sc, will forward it later on to uh, GVisor. So let's go ahead and run that. And then again, I already have that here, so it says already installed. And then we need to actually now create, I need to, as sudo, we need to configure container D to use the shim that we just um, installed. So we need to run it as sudo i, and then we need to then create this configuration file, let's go ahead and create that. And then we exit. 
And then we need to now restart container D. So let's go ahead and run that on line 31. That's done. Now we need to actually install runtime class for GWiser. So this is the command that we need to do. Um, the kind is um, runtime class, and then we name it GVisor, and the handler is run SC. Let's go ahead and run that. So it's our, I already configured that, so it didn't change anything. Uh, but you get a different message when you do that yourself. So, and then on line 43, we verify the GVisor is listed as a runtime class. And we see that indeed GVisor is now uh, shows as run SC. Okay, let's go ahead now. We deploy a pod. And this is the one that I showed you during the presentation. Um, so the only difference is really is we specify the runtime class as GVisor. So that this is where it will be hosted now. The runtime will be managed by GVisor. And again, I'm going to use N Nginx, and everything else is really the same. So let's go ahead and run that. Let's see that that's created. Now, to, in order to verify that um, the call will not be going through the um, host kernel um, on line 59, let's go ahead and run something called uh, DMESG, which is really the uh, Linux utility for displaying the messages that flow within the kernel ring. But see, I want to take, uh, just take a look at the output. And if we go down here, we see there's a lot of stuff that is coming from the host. So this actually is coming from the host itself. Now, uh, because I'm running it on the uh, node. So let's uh, uh, SSH into the, uh, the part that we just created. Let's go and clear this. The GVisor, uh, uh, Nginx GVisor, the name of the pod. Let's go then. Now we are inside that. Now let's, let's go in and run the same command, but we are now inside um, G, uh, the, the, the pod. And, and it's, as you can see, if I scroll up here, it's, it starts from here. You'll see that it's very, very few call, which means that now everything is running inside. Um, the, the kernel that is, is managed by uh, GVisor, the, the sentry that we talked about. So this is the proof that our, our pod is actually now uh, hosted on top of GVisor. So GVisor now is protecting or uh, preventing the, the pod from getting outside its environment and into the host environment.